Hey, Impact Church family, welcome back to Church at Home. Hopefully you guys have had an awesome week and that you are living sent in your sphere of influence. If you're new here today, checking us out for the first time, we want to encourage you to do a couple of things. First, go to our homepage at impactkingston.com. Go to the New Here tab. Click on that. Just fill that out for us. We'd love the opportunity to follow up with you. As well, subscribe to our YouTube channel at impactchurch-kingston. Want to connect with our Impact Prayer tomorrow night? Simply email prayer at impactkingston.com. Next, we have a very special event coming up on Sunday, February the 7th at 7 p.m. We're calling it our Newcomers Connection. We've noticed over the last several months, both online and in person, uh, that we've had so many new people, so many new families connect at Impact. And we want to just uh, create a connection point for you with Sandra and I, not only just to connect with us, have an opportunity to do some Q&A about the church, but we actually want to share with you a little more about our DNA and our discipleship process as a church so that you can be informed about those very, very key and important things. Last but not least, once again, we have a very special parenting small group coming up called Thrive starting Sunday, February the 14th at 8 p.m. It's running for four weeks. If you're interested in coming, simply email me, Cameron at impactkingston.com. Now we have a very special um, week two of our Be Bold message series, and Scott's going to come and bring that message for us. Good morning, Impact Church. It is so great to be back with you again and love being able to communicate with you through text and all that stuff that we can actually have somewhat of a normal live experience. This is great. I love this. Uh, last week, we talked about being bold and going after the one and stopping for the one and the power that you possess in and of yourself and how awesome that is and really how tangible evangelism really can be and the power that you possess to reach those people. And I really feel like there is a stirring within the church body, uh, not just in our church, but I think in this city that people are hungry for going to chase after the lost and that we as a church, we are not just set free, but we are set free and we are sent out. And we want to see the city of Kingston transformed, but the only way that the city can be transformed is by believers who have been transformed. And I believe that you are going to be transformed through the message that I am sharing this week and this whole series, to be honest with you. And I love it when um, people are radically touched by the presence of God, when they are transformed by the presence of God, whether that's on a Sunday morning, whether it's on a deeper night or an encounter weekend or even in your worship experience and prayer time at home. And believe me, I've been touched by the power of God. Many times I have flopped on the floor like a fish out of water countless times, and it's awesome. And those moments, they're powerful, and they're really good. But what really truly matters is what happens after those encounters that we have with God. Are we transformed after those encounters? Are they temporary moments, or are they lasting moments? Are they moments of the soul, or are they moments of the Spirit? And do we have the boldness to get up after those moments and become a disciple of Christ? 
And what I want to go after this morning is talk about something really powerful, and it is talking about the bold power of the mystery of Christ revealed. And it's going to be so much fun. I'm excited. Let's get at it. Now, people in this world, they are driven by mystery. They are driven by things that they cannot quite understand. They're driven by things that are not of their mental comprehension. And they seek after things that they can't naturally see or touch or feel with their own eyes or with their hands. And it's very evident in the world around us. Even in North American culture specifically, you look at the movement that's happened over the last 10 to 15 years. And you look at, you know, the different uh, books and movies and TV shows that have been released that are all, you know, very superhero or supernatural or um, super spiritual or, or magical or, or, or sorcery, all these crazy things. There's been such a, a large movement in this area because people are hungry for something that is greater than themselves. People are seeking after a mystery. And the idea of something supernatural, though, unfortunately, it has driven people to search for it everywhere they go. And they're not just looking for it in the right places, but they're looking for it in the wrong places. People are chasing after something supernatural. Now, how many know that our God is a supernatural God? God is spirit. He is supernatural. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. That is who our God is. But how many know that the enemy also has power? And the enemy tries to do anything, but he, all he tries to do is counterfeit miracles. He cannot create anything new on his own. He is a smoke and mirrors type guy where he tries to deceive people and do these counterfeit miracles to try to get them to believe that he actually is the all-powerful one because people are seeking after this kind of thing and he tries to be that gap for people. A great example of this is in the book of Exodus where Moses and Aaron, they were standing before Pharaoh and they perform all these signs and wonders and miracles. But then Pharaoh those magicians, they perform counterfeit miracles and signs and wonders that kind of matched what Moses and Aaron did. But the true, the idea that I want to get across to you is that people are hungry for something deeper than themselves and they're seeking after some kind of mystery. And the reality is that mystery draws people and it draws their attention no matter what the source is. But unfortunately, if it is drawn from a source that is demonic in nature, if it is drawn from a source that the enemy creates, then it actually opens the door to the demonic in their lives. But people are hungry for something that is greater than themselves. In Isaiah chapter 8, uh, this seems rather blunt, but to kind of sum it up, uh, there's people who are seeking after something supernatural. And basically they say that, you know, if we can't find it in the people of God, then we're going to seek after mediums and witches to go get it. It's in there, Ma uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 8, verses 19. And it sounds extreme. And you may be thinking, oh, well, that's, that's just in the biblical times. That's way back in the Bible. I don't think we'd see that stuff today. But, but trust me, it is happening. It may not be right there in our face. You know, we may not be chasing after, you know, witches that have crazy black top hats and really wild hair flying around on a broomstick. But people are chasing after these things. You know, I've done some research in the last few uh, weeks and I've found some crazy stats I want to share with you. In 2019, there were $2.2 billion spent on psychics in the United States alone. There has been a 300% increase in the sales of Ouija boards in that time frame. And in 1990, there were an estimated 8,000 Wicca witches in the United States. But today, that number has jumped up to 1.5 million witches in the States. That's a, a shocking jump of 625% per year. People are chasing after something that is mysterious and beyond their own comprehension and beyond themselves. And it's not just the spiritual mystery, but people are chasing after the psychedelic, unnatural, s weird, crazy world of drugs too. In, uh, in the last five years, there has been a 600% increase in ER visits due to accidental drug overdoses. And in the first six months of 2020 was one of the worst years that it's ever happened. I saw it firsthand. There have been uh, all, the, all the way across Canada, there are 15 fatalities per day from accidental drug overdoses in this nation. That is crazy. That is because people are seeking after something that is further than themselves, something that is beyond themselves that they can't understand because they are hungry for a mystery. They are hungry for something that is not of this world. But let me remind you, child of God, that you are not of this world. And you carry the very mystery that people are seeking after and that people are hungry after. Okay? Ephesians 2 verses, verse 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him 
in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You are not a natural being that is having the occasional supernatural experience. No, child of God, you are a supernatural being that has a, 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 an ability to transform the natural. That is who you are. You are a supernatural being transforming the natural. And this really is the foundation that I want to lay for this morning's message. And I have one simple take-home thought, and it's this. The mystery of God revealed through you will transform this city. I'll say it again. The mystery of God revealed through you will transform this very city. You see, it was a mystery of God. It was a work of God that knocked Saul off of his horse and caused him to believe in the Messiah. And it was a mystery and work of God that shook the earth when Jesus was crucified and the soldier at his foot said, truly, this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And it was a mystery and wonder of God that caused Pentecost to happen and shift an entire region and caused thousands of people to come to Christ. And it was the mystery revealed through Jesus and the spiritual gifts of prophecy and word of knowledge to tell the, the, um, the Samaritan woman at the well all about who he is and all about her uh, past and present and future and cause her and an entire generation city to come to Christ. And it is a life filled with mystery that you possess that will cause people around you who are seeking after something other than themselves to turn their heads and say, what is it that this person has that I don't have? What is this mystery that they possess? Okay, much like Moses, he's a great example. He was walking in the desert and he saw a bush that was burning, but it was not being consumed by the flames. It was a mystery and it was intriguing to him. And it says he turned to look. He turned aside to, it drew his attention. And as he stepped into that intrigue, as he drew into that, it says God spoke to him. Okay, And as we step out boldly and release the mystery of God revealed through us to other people around us, God too will speak through you to that person as we draw into that mystery, as we highlight the mystery that God has spoken into you and to me. And you see, if it weren't for the mystery of Christ revealed through us, then we would simply be stuck in a pattern of religious predictability. And this is a, a painful pattern that unfortunately a lot of places get caught up into. And if we live in this realm, then there is no draw to the outside world. If we live in predictability and, and normal religious patterns, then the outside world will not be drawn to it. Okay? How many of you have experienced something supernatural of God that you just simply can't explain? I know I've had countless experiences that I just can't explain only but God. God is the only explanation for these things, whether it's a, a healing or a miracle or a divine provision or uh, a sign and a wonder or maybe uh, the overwhelming sense of peace that only God can bring or the overwhelming, unexplainable joy that only Christ can give. It is these things that keeps drawing us back, that stirs up a hunger within us to chase after the more of God. And this unexplainable mystery is what draws us to Jesus. Now, if we were to run into a, a non-believer on the street and they uh, said they know, you know, they think they know everything there is to know about God and, you know, they've had experiences at church, they've had experiences through watching movies and, and videos and all that stuff of what they believe church is, but they don't see anything exciting, they don't see some kind of mystery to draw them in, then um, there's nothing that's going to cause them to want to go any deeper with it. They think that it's a predictable pattern that is, is just never ending, but a mystery, it upsets the mundane norm of people's lives, and you are a possessor of the mystery that upsets the normal of people's lives, okay? It opens the door for God to download a truth into their lives. See, think about it. If you were out at the store or something, and God downloaded a prophetic word or a word of knowledge or the gift of healing to bring to someone, and you, and you boldly step out and activate that, it would completely transform that person's thought process and interrupt the normal of that person's lives, and it would open up the door for God to reveal his truth into that person's heart. And this is the second type of evangelism that I want to highlight today. Last week, we talked about relational evangelism and how powerful and, and uh, effective that is. But this week, I want to talk about a different style of evangelism, and that is a supernatural evangelism. It is so awesome, so powerful, so transforming. In a second, split second, it can completely transform someone's heart and someone's mind. And you may be thinking, whoa, that's kind of scary. That's not for me. It's only for the Christian elite. But let me tell you, 
you are activated, you are ready to go, you're ready to be released into these things. If you're a child of God, you are capable, you have the capacity for supernatural evangelism. Paul said, do not neglect the spiritual gifts. And he said that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And it also says in the Bible that all sons and daughters shall prophesy. So this is something that God has called you to do, not just the leaders of the church, the pastors of the church, but every single member of the body can be activated in the supernatural gifts, the spiritual gifts of God. And if you want to know more about this, uh, we'll be starting up Activate Ministry at some point whenever we get back together. And uh, basically what we're going to do is teach people how to activate the spiritual gifts in their everyday lives. Now you see, without mystery in our lives, then faith deteriorates to something, like I said, is very predictable and it's a pattern. And if it's something that we can create in our own mind, if it's something that is um, recreatable, if it's something that's predictable and understandable and we know what's going to happen, and if it's something that we can create in our own natural ability, then all we simply have is religion. And now I'm so thankful that we go to a church that is open to the move of God, that is open to the things of the Holy Spirit. And we have allowed some of our Sunday mornings to get completely derailed from the, the, from the you know, order of service simply because God is speaking in a certain area. And I love that. I love that we are willing to go where the Spirit goes so that it is not predictable and we're not stuck in a box and put Jesus in a box because otherwise all we'd have is a, a religion but no mystery to manifest. And people are, are tired of religion. People don't want religion. People want to see the power of God transform. And they want to see it through miracles happening. They want to see eyes open, blind eyes open, and deaf ears open, and, and paralyzed limbs walking, and limbs grow out, and all that stuff, and that awesome um, power of God. And unfortunately, if people don't see those things happening from the body of Christ, then they're going to seek it elsewhere. They're going to seek it through Wicca. They're going to seek it through the occult, through witchcraft, and through the psychedelic realm of drugs. That's the unfortunate truth, is that the church has to embody the mystery of Christ. We need to be um, resembling everything, every aspect of Christ, and that involves the spiritual mystery of God. And this is why I believe that the 2020 culture that we live in um, is, we have to think differently about how we um, play out apologetics and how we defend the gospel and how we defend the word. And I don't believe it, 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 I don't believe it can stay the same. I don't think, I think we need to adjust with the times. And now I'm not saying that we need to not defend the gospel. We will always defend the gospel and always stand up for what is true and what is right. But it is in the how that we do it that is going to transform people's lives. It is not through arguments. It's not through a debate, but it's through a display of the mystery power of God that is going to transform people's hearts. It is revealing the mystery through supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. See, I believe it is no longer solely about an intellectual decision, intellectual understanding of Christ, but it is about um, displaying God. Because, you know, this information age that we live in, people can find information everywhere. And there's a flood of information and empty words that are being thrown at people, but it is lacking power. The, the world needs to see the power of God. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. I'm not trying to devalue the word, but it is about demonstrating the word and activating the word through power. It is no longer trying to persuade people. We cannot try and persuade people with well-thought-out arguments, but it is about displaying the goodness of God, displaying the power of God, and the, revealing the very mystery of of who Christ is. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 4 to 5 says, Our gospel didn't come to you with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Holy Ghost and of power. See, I am forever, forever fascinated by one of the greatest mysteries in the New Testament. And that's how um, a bumbling bunch of crazy nobodies uh, uh, called the disciples uh, somehow got transformed in this revolutionary revival army that transformed the world all because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And we see this empowerment take place in Acts chapter 2, and it carries on throughout the entire book of Acts by activating the spiritual gifts, by walking in and revealing the mystery to the world around them. And you see this moment in time, this, um, this receiving of the Holy Spirit and of power, it birthed something that completely transformed 
uh, the way that these disciples live their lives. It created a new boldness, a new power, and a new courage in each and every one of them. And we think of them as, as these mighty men and women of God, and, and they were, but before that, they weren't. They were normal people like you and like me. A great example are Philip and Stephen. I love these guys. These are like heroes to me because one day they were taking orders at at a, at a restaurant for old ladies. And the next day they were literally taking cities for Jesus. This is the empowerment that the Holy Spirit has for you when you reveal the mystery to the world around you. And now when I received this baptism of the Holy Spirit, when I received the power of the Holy Spirit, I was immediately drawn to the gift of prophecy specifically. And I always never could really comprehend it. I didn't think I'd be able to understand it. And as I kept diving into it and understanding more of it and having God reveal himself to me and, and, and I started activating the gift and started prophesying to those around me, I started to get a better understanding of it. But I was always confused by teachings that would teach on 1 Corinthians 20, uh, 14 verse 22 um, that really it was more active in the church than it was out in the world because of this one verse. It says, so you see, speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. How could that be? I didn't quite understand that. How could like one of the greatest gifts of the Holy Spirit that literally reveals God's heart and his love and his plan for people not be for unbelievers? I don't get that. But then fast forward a couple of verses later, look at this. I don't know why this isn't highlighted in a lot of teachings, but it says in verses 24 to 25, it says, but if everyone is prophesying and an unbeliever or one without the gift enters your meeting, he will be convinced by all that he hears and will be called to account for the intimate secrets of his heart will be brought to light. He will be mystified and fall down in worship and say, God is truly among you. Wow, come on. See, the unbeliever will be brought to repentance and he'll say, truly, God is among you. And check this out. It says, notice that the mystery of his life will be revealed. See, the revelation the, of the mystery that this person has been seeking in the world, in the confusion, in the chaos of the world, will actually be released through the mystery of the revelation of heaven through the gift of prophecy to that individual. See, there's a deep longing for something more in the hearts of humanity. Notice in Ecclesiastes verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 11, it says that God has placed eternity in the human heart. Now, there's a deep longing for something of eternal value. But notice it says not in, he hasn't placed eternity in the believer's heart. He has placed it in humanity's heart. So believers and unbelievers have this longing for something deeper than themselves. Okay, what we see in the world is just people searching to fill that eternal void that is within their hearts, but they're seeking after it in all the wrong places, right? They know that there's something more. There's no, they know that there's a mystery that is, that is within them, that they need to find out what it is, but they're going after it in all the wrong places. And we are the ones who reveal the true mystery of the gospel to them. And it is something that... Um, that we cannot comprehend with our natural eyes. It is something that we cannot quite understand is this mystery. And it is for us to reveal it to those, pre those people because um, eternity is not something that we can comprehend in our mind, right? It says that he has placed eternity in our hearts and not in our minds, right? That's why I believe faith is actually not a decision of the intellect, but is a decision of the heart. See, the way I, I kind of view it is, is this, is that you can picture a mosquito, right? Bzz, mosquito, they are not designed to know how to build a car, right? They, they just don't have that mental comprehension. It is not in their mindset, their mental capacity to know how to build a car. Much like humanity is not meant to understand mentally and have the mental uh, con um, ability to know how to understand eternity, right? It's not in our mind. It is actually in our hearts. And when we reveal the mystery of Christ in our lives through the power of God, it actually stirs something. It builds a hunger and a yearning in people's hearts, but they don't understand it in their mind because it says eternity is not in their mind. Eternity is in their hearts. So they don't understand why they are drawn to something. But when we boldly go out and we activate the supernatural, we activate the gifts of God, it stirs something and it draws them, much like Moses was drawn to that burning bush, right? It is drawing something in the hearts of humanity and faith can build and hope can arise in these people in a split second by activating the mystery revealed of Christ. 
That is God's calling for our church. And, you know, it's, it's actually not about the church. It's not about church. Because if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that uh, we are the church. And it, ha- it doesn't have anything to do with physically being at the church, as much as I love it, as powerful as it is. But, you know, Sundays are really about getting filled with Jesus, getting so filled with God that we leak God everywhere we go, that Jesus is just pouring out, us, out of us Monday through Saturday. And Sundays, we just come back and we just get filled and filled and filled, right? And this kind of revival was actually prophesied about in the Bible, in Ezekiel. Um, and and it, it talks about a church um, that was so, um, so sent out that like literally streams of water would pour out of this church and, and, and the revival grew wider and wider and greater and greater. And it's in Ezekiel 47 verse 9. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed. And everything will live wherever the river goes. See, this passage promises a great healing and a very great multitude of fish. Now think fish. Think when Jesus told Peter, I'm going to make you a fisher of man, right? So we're talking about souls. We're talking about a great harvest that is coming. And it's because the church moves into the streets. It's not because we open our doors and the, 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 the world comes to us, but it's because the church goes into the, the streets that healings happen and the mystery is revealed. But when the river doesn't flow, there is stagnation, much like the Dead Sea. See, the Dead Sea is given its name because it is stagnant, because there is no outflow. See, there is an inflow, but there's no outflow, all right? If I can use a medical term, it's constipated, okay? I believe that the church is spiritually constipated. Come on, follow me here for a second. There is so much information out there, so many teachings, so many sermons, so many blogs, so many whatever that we are filling and filling and filling, but there is not enough outflow. And in order for vibrant life to exist, it says the rivers must flow. There must be an outflow of the body of Christ. And there is going to be something stirring within the church body that I believe is going to happen this year for the city of Kingston, that when we activate the gifts, when we activate the mystery of Christ revealed in our lives and activate the supernatural, not just within the four walls of the church, but outside the four walls of the church, we are going to see a great harvest happen. I love that the Holy Spirit says the waters have to go there is what it says. The waters have to go. We have to be willing to go where the lost are in order to find them. And if we don't, then there won't be a great harvest of fish. Now, we can only display these living waters. We can only display this mystery of God because first it has been revealed to us. We have had the mystery of Christ and his power revealed to us. But not only that, this is so cool, but we have had the mystery, wisdom, and revelation, knowledge of Jesus Christ himself revealed to us. Check this out. Luke 8 verse 10 says, the knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that though seeing they may not see, through, though hearing they may not understand. You see, you carry the mystery You carry the mystery. Do you know what that makes you? That makes you a revelation. You see, the world rejects the message of the gospel. And the reason they they reject the message of the gospel is because they can't understand it, because they have been veiled. All right, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The Bible says our gospel is veiled. See, unbelievers don't understand because they can't understand. It takes God to reveal God. Or if I can say another way, it takes God through you to reveal God. Or it takes God to remove the veil. Or God through you to remove the veil. Lost people don't understand because they can't understand without the veil removed. Now, this is so cool. I want to share something awesome with you. The word veil in the Greek is the word kalupsis, okay? I don't know if I'm saying that right, but we're we're going to go with it. The word veil is the word kalupsis. And the Greek for the word revelation is the word apokalupsis, okay? So add apo in front of kalupsis. It's the same kind of word, okay? So to see the lost converted requires a God-sent revelation to undo the veil. All right, follow me for a second. 
a deeper translation for the word apoclopsis is revealing things that were before unknown. Wow. So that is talking about the revelation gifts of the Holy Spirit or the, the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and prophecy. Okay, an even deeper understanding of that word is uh, it means to manifest. It means a manifestation. What is that? That's talking about miracles. That's talking about healing. So in order for the, uh, the veil to be removed, for the collapsus to be lifted, there needs to be an apocalypsis or a revelation of the mystery of Christ through the spiritual gifts. Come on, how cool is that? So the cover-up is what Satan does, but the uncovering is what God does through you. And if you're trying to witness to somebody through intellect and through conversation and you feel like you're hitting a brick wall and you feel like they're just not getting it, it's because they cannot get it apart from the apocalypsis. Come on, how cool is that? They need to receive a revelation of the mystery revealed. And you are the carrier of the mystery of God revealed. You are a possessor of the mystery of God. Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning uh, and he awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Now that word learned in the Greek references uh, this kind of mental understanding that can be translated as learning the secret. Or if I can put it another way, learning the mystery. See, he has given to you a tongue which possesses the secret to the kingdom of heaven. You have the tongue of the mystery of God revealed, and you have the answers that humanity is actually seeking after. You have the ability imparted to you to speak a word in season to those who are weary. Now, the Holy Spirit has, is the great revealer of mysteries and the great revealer of wisdom. And in John 14, 26, it says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Now, one way that the, that the Holy Spirit-filled Christian um, has an advantage over the rest of the world is through a very unique avenue, uh, through the ability of speaking in tongues. Now, speaking in tongues is, uh, is um, evidence that one has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to get all into the details of that because we went through that in the 829 series if you want to know more about it. But it is evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about speaking in tongues when we're talking about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because it literally stirs up your soul, it stirs up your spirit and gets you fired up and active and bold in reaching the lost. And I want to highlight something really incredible that was a true breakthrough moment for me in my walk uh, in boldness and in power. And it's uh, this here in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2. It says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them, but they utter mysteries in the Spirit. Huh, there's that word mysteries again. They utter mysteries in the Spirit. And you're like, well, well, that's great. What does that even mean? Follow me here for a second. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 and 7 says, uh, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, check this, we declare God's wisdom comma, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory from the beginning of time. Come on, it says, we declare God's wisdom is a mystery. Okay, a mystery is God's wisdom. It is the wisdom of God. That's what a mystery is. So we speak a mystery. We speak a, the wisdom of God when we speak in tongues. Let me take it a step further. Vine's Bible dictionary, literally a dictionary about words that are in the Bible, says this about the word mystery. It says that which being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension. Wow. It can only be made known by divine revelation. It is made known in a manner or time appointed by God to those illuminated by his spirit. It is the counsel or the secret plan which God reveals only to his people. Therefore, when you speak in tongues, you speak a mystery, which is a divine revelation only given by God and not by human means. We have a wisdom that is not of this age. And when you speak in tongues, you are speaking the revelation of heaven itself. Wow. Okay, let me take it a step further. I feel like you don't really quite believe me. So I'm going to go a little bit further here. All right. First Corinthians 14, 18. Paul says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Or if you're like me, you have the Texas International Version. It's y'all. I speak tongues more than y'all. Um, says he has spoken more than anyone else. So clearly the Bible does not lie, right? We all know that. 
2 Corinthians, or sorry, 2 Timothy 3.16. The Bible does not lie, all right? He says that he has spoken in tongues more than anybody else in all of history, basically, right? Meaning he has more wisdom and more God revelation than anyone else in history, all right? Do you agree? I hope you agree. Okay, so who spoke in tongues more than anyone else? Paul. Who has had more revelation from God than anyone else? Paul. Who wrote more books of the Bible than anyone else in all of history? Paul, because he has had the wisdom revealed to him because he has spoken in tongues more than anyone else in all of history. Now, I've put this to the test. I know that I've made this a part of my everyday life that I speak in tongues every single day. And there's a great example. I've used this many times to kind of get the advantage and, and realize that I'm a supernatural being trying to transform the natural. And a number of years ago, um, I was dropping curling off at worship practice, and we had our SUV back before we had our awesome rockin' Van Uh We had the, our SUV, and it was a remote starter, and it was like a keyless entry thing. So um, you didn't use the physical key, but you could. Uh, and anyway, so I was driving. She was uh, riding shotgun, and so I dropped her at the front door, and she went running in. Turns out she had the key in her pocket. So, of course, the vehicle, as she went running in, the vehicle started beeping, and, and all of a sudden it shut down. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, she must have a key. I'll go and get it. I went running in, uh, grabbed the keys, came back to the vehicle, and uh, tried to start it, and nothing. I wasn't getting anything. And this story is going to reveal my ineptitude towards understanding vehicles. Um, so I, I tried to get started, absolutely nothing. Great, okay. Um, you know, I tried troubleshooting a couple different things. I tried uh, putting the, a physical key in and turning it, and it wouldn't even turn over. There was nothing. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go. I guess I'll read the manual. And, you know, I started flipping through the manual. I'm like, you know what? Forget this. I have the manual of the Holy Spirit within me to reveal all knowledge and all understanding. And I just learned this message and this teaching about the mystery of Christ revealed through me or the mystery of speaking tongues through me. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to speak in tongues and I'm going to see what God does. And so I spoke in tongues for five seconds. I started yabba dabba doing. And within five seconds, the Holy Spirit so clearly said to me, Scott, look down. Huh? Oh, it's in drive. That's why it's not going anywhere. Oh, dummy. Okay. Uh, so I put it in park and away we go. Um, and I've countless stories like that where I can't find my keys. I can't find my wallet. And I'll just start speaking in tongues. And the Holy Spirit, like so quickly, will say, hey, Scott, you left your keys right there. Wow. Awesome. Come on. Th this, is, this is how we live a supernatural lifestyle. You are not a natural being having the occasional supernatural experience. You are a supernatural being that is here to transform the natural and to reveal a mystery to the world around you. Now, I want to wrap this up with one very powerful verse in Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It says, there is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations, but now it's being revealed. It's being unfolded and manifested for every holy believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This is this mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people. And God wants everyone to know it. Church, you are a carrier of the manifested revelation of the glory, power, wisdom, understanding of God himself. And it is through the revealing of this mystery that the world will come to know Christ. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory for all to see. Church, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to this message today. For more information about Impact Church, follow us on social media or check out our website at impactkingston.com.